Hi guys, welcome back to the next part of our physical chemistry lecture series. So we've covered a lot of topics in our previous two series on phases and thermodynamics. So in the series, we'll be discussing how these two topics can finally come together. Okay, so we're going to be looking at phase equilibria. Okay, so recall what we just discussed from our last video. We looked at different criteria for spontaneity, right? And from the second law, we derived entropy as a state function. And we saw from the Clausius inequality that for spontaneous processes in isolated systems, the entropy of the system will be positive or equal to zero. Okay, so more specifically, an irreversible process will lead to an increase in entropy until it reaches the maximum, okay, which is the equilibrium state. Okay. However, as discussed previously, the use of entropy as a criterion for spontaneity can only be applied if we have an isolated system, which is not the case for many of the processes of interest. Therefore, we derived from the Clausius inequality another criteria for spontaneity that is applicable at constant temperature and pressure conditions, which was our Gibbs free energy. Okay, So based on the Clausius inequality, the Gibbs free energy of a system for irreversible spontaneous processes will decrease until it reaches a minimum, okay, and this minimum corresponds to the equilibrium state. So since temperature and pressure are held constant, Gibbs free energy is the most convenient criterion for spontaneity, okay? So we'll be using Gibbs free energy for our further discussions on equilibrium, okay? So again, let's recall some of the derivations we've done in our last lecture, okay? So keep in mind that we've been limiting our discussion to closed systems with fixed composition and with just PV work, okay? So for these types of systems, we could write dg plus SDT minus VDP is less than or equal to zero for spontaneous processes. Okay, so for reversible processes or for systems in equilibrium, we'll be looking at when DG plus SDT minus VDP is equal to zero. Okay, so for irreversible processes that are spontaneous, this quantity is going to be less than zero. Okay, so overall we could rewrite an expression for DG as just dg is equal to negative sdt plus vdp, okay? So this here, this is the Gibbs equation for Gibbs free energy, which corresponds to an equilibrium state, okay? So to expand our definition of Gibbs free energy, let's look at its dependent variables, okay? So in our previous discussion, again, we limited ourselves to a closed system with fixed composition, okay? So for systems in which there are changes in composition, however, Gibbs free energy will also be dependent on the number of moles of each component in our system. Okay, so overall we could write G as a function of temperature and pressure, okay, so which we know previously, as well as the number of moles in the system. Okay, so for simplicity, let's limit ourselves to a one component system. Okay, so we could investigate the change in Gibbs free energy based on its dependent variables by writing the total differential. Okay, so the way that we write total differentials is dg. Okay, so the change in the variable g as being dependent on the corresponding changes of its other dependent variables. Okay, so we could write this as partial of g with respect to one variable, let's say temperature, while the other variables are being held constant, pressure and n, times dt. Okay, so what this part here pretty much says is that how does g change as temperature changes, okay? So the partial derivative of G with respect to T at constant pressure and number of moles tells us how G changes as temperature changes, okay? So let's look at the other dependent variables, okay? So we'll also look at how Gibbs free energy changes as pressure changes. So this is partial of G with respect to P at constant temperature and number of moles times dp, and we'll also look at now at how Gibbs free energy changes with a change in number of moles, okay? So dg, partial of g with respect to n at constant temperature and pressure times dn, all right? 
Okay, so recall as well that we got another expression for dg, right? Okay, so in our previous slide, we said that dg is equal to negative sdt plus vdp for a closed system of fixed composition. Okay, so from this expression, we could kind of equate these two things together and define what the partial derivatives of g are. Okay, so from here, we could make an analogy, right? Okay, so dg is equal to negative sdt plus vdp, right? Okay, so we could see that these two parts are equal to one another. Okay, so we could say that partial of G with respect to T at constant pressure and number of moles is equal to negative S. Okay, so let's just write that down. Partial of G with respect to T at constant pressure and number of moles is equal to negative S. Okay, so we could also see that this partial derivative is going to be equal to V. Okay, so partial of G with respect to P at constant temperature and number of moles, this is going to be equal to V, okay? So what we haven't considered previously, however, is this part here, okay? So how could we define the change in G with the change in number of moles of the system at constant temperature and pressure, okay? So we are going to define this partial derivative, so partial of G with respect to N at constant temperature and pressure, let's define this as mu, okay? So mu, this is our so-called chemical potential, okay? So we could expand this part over here as plus mu dN. All right. Okay, so actually chemical potential, this is a thermodynamic parameter related to the flow of matter. Okay, so we'll be placing a lot of our attention now at chemical potential because we'll see how this can be used as a measure to determine the direction of processes in which there are changes in the amount of chemical substances. Okay, so to get a better picture of the importance of chemical potential, let's review the different types of equilibrium we've discussed before. Okay, so pre Previously, we talked about mechanical equilibrium, right? So in the context of pressure volume work, work is done by the system when it exerts a higher pressure than the surroundings, okay? So when P system is greater than P external, okay? So we do not have mechanical equilibrium, okay? So mechanical equilibrium is going to be established when the pressure of the system is equal to the pressure of the surroundings or the exerted pressure. Okay, so this pretty much happens because the internal and external forces are balanced and there is going to be no network that will be done when we have this condition satisfied. All right, so we also looked at thermal equilibrium. Okay, so thermal equilibrium is established when we have equal temperatures. Okay, so previously we saw that when the temperature of our system is greater than the temperature of the surroundings, okay? So we have a heat flow from the temperature to the surroundings until we reach a state where the temperature of the system is going to be equal to the temperature of the surroundings, okay? So once this condition is met, we now have thermal equilibrium, okay? And there is going to be no net heat flow now that the temperatures are equal, okay? So analogously, for material equilibrium, matter tends to flow from regions of high chemical potential to regions of low chemical potential, okay? So when we have a higher chem chemical potential in one part than another part, there's going to be a flow of matter from region 1 to region 2 until these chemical potentials are going to be equal, okay? So once this condition is met, okay, we have established material equilibrium, okay? So essentially, it is differences in chemical potential that drives processes like diffusion, phase changes, chemical reactions, okay? So for diffusion, we typically see this as a flow of something due to a concentration difference, right? Okay, so to draw this out, right? So let's say that we have this region, okay? Super high concentration of one solute and another region with a low concentration of solid, right? Okay, so diffusion, we know this from our previous experience as a flow of this substance to another region since there's a higher concentration of this substance than this region, right? Okay, so previously we saw this as 
being driven by a concentration difference, okay? More accurately, however, it's more appropriate to look at this in terms of differences in chemical potential, okay? So we actually have a higher chemical potential in this region and a lower chemical potential in this region, okay? So once, once equilibrium is established, we'll eventually have equal chemical potentials on both sides, okay? So we'll see that the same principle in chemical potential differences is what drives phase changes and chemical reactions, which are, again, processes in which there are changes in the amounts of chemical substances. Okay, so for now, we'll be looking at phase changes, and later on in the next part of our series, we'll be looking at chemical reactions, okay? So for our discussion on phase changes, here's an outline. Okay, so for this video, we'll be looking at the thermodynamics of phase equilibrium in the context of chemical potential. Okay, we'll also discuss the Gibbs phase rule, which will first apply for one component phase equilibrium. Okay, so later on in our next video, we'll expand our consideration to multiple component systems. So first we'll be considering condensed phase equilibria, and then in our third video, we'll be looking at liquid vapor equilibrium and we'll also expand this to colligative properties okay so we'll be discussing some things like osmotic pressure and vapor pressure lowering okay so just to start off let's review some things that we already know from our general chemistry okay so since we're dealing with phase equilibrium we know that we can summarize the phase equilibrium of a pure substance using a phase diagram okay so here we have the phase diagram of water. Okay, so a phase diagram tells us the variation of phase stability and phase transitions at varying pressures and temperature conditions. Okay, so for example, if we have constant pressure at one atmosphere, we could determine at which temperatures we'll have the solid phase, the liquid phase, or the gas phase. Okay, we could also identify certain transition temperatures, okay? So here we know that we have the melting temperature of water at zero degrees Celsius, and we also have the boiling temperature of water at 100 degrees Celsius, okay? So these temperatures, these are known as your normal melting and your normal boiling points, okay? So to generalize, we know that for any pressure and temperature within this region, the most stable phase is a solid, okay? So the same thing can be said about this region over here. We have the liquid as the most stable phase and this region over here in which we have the gas as the most stable phase, okay? So you might be wondering, why isn't the gas or liquid phase stable in this particular region? As we discussed previously in some of our problems, we know that any gas or liquid at these conditions in this region over here will actually spontaneously transform itself into a solid, okay? So we'll look Look at chemical potentials in order to evaluate which phase is going to be stable at which conditions, okay? So now let's look at the boundaries, okay? So as we mentioned earlier, whenever we have a boundary, we have a corresponding phase transition, okay? So at this point over here, we have two phases that are stable and in equilibrium, okay? So namely on along this line over here, we have solid and liquid phases that are stable, okay? So they're going to be in equilibrium with one another, okay? So we could also wonder why does phase equilibrium occur at these particular conditions, okay? So again, we'll be investigating this in the context of chemical potentials, okay? So let's consider, for the sake of discussion, liquid vapor equilibrium of a pure substance, okay? Where some of the substance gets transferred from the vapor to the liquid phase, okay? So this equilibrium process here, this is going to be at constant, temperature and pressure, okay? So if we're going to evaluate the Gibbs for this, the Gibbs is going to be equal to the Gibbs free energy of the liquid and the Gibbs free energy of the gas, okay? So if we get the corresponding differential of this, okay? So keep in mind that we're going to be keeping temperature and pressure constant, okay? We just need to consider the chemical potentials, okay, or the partial derivatives of G with respect to the number of moles of that component in the liquid phase or with respect to the number of moles in the gaseous phase, okay? So we could rewrite this as dG is equal to partial of G with respect to the number of moles in the liquid phase times dNL 
plus partial of G with respect to the number of moles in the gaseous phase times dNG. Okay, so this here, this is at constant temperature pressure and number of moles in the gaseous phase. And this here is also at constant temperature pressure and constant number of moles in the liquid phase. Okay, so overall, this is just dG is equal to the chemical potential in the liquid phase times dNL, the change in number of number of moles in the liquid phase, plus the chemical potential in the gaseous phase times the change in number of moles in the gaseous phase. Okay, so let's also illustrate what this means over here, where some of the substance gets transferred from one from the vapor to the liquid phase. Okay, so if we have equilibrium between the liquid and the gaseous or the vapor phase, okay, if ever we have a transfer of some of this substance from the gas to the liquid phase, okay, this change is going to be equal, okay? So if there's a corresponding loss from the gas phase, it's going to be gained by the liquid phase, okay? So the change in number of moles of liquid is going to be equal to, but opposite in sign to the change in number of moles in the gas, all right? Okay, so we could rewrite this expression over here, okay? We could rewrite this as dg is equal to, okay, mu g dn g minus mu l times dng okay so we just replace this term over here with negative dng okay let's move on to a fresh slide here and continue our derivation okay so in this case dg is now equal to mu g minus mu l times dNG, okay, the change in number of moles in the gaseous phase, okay? So at equilibrium, we know that dG has to be equal to zero, okay? So since this over here is not going to be equal to zero, this corresponds to a transfer of matter, okay? So this means that mu G has to be equal to mu l okay so the chemical potential in the gaseous phase has to be equal to the chemical potential in the liquid phase at equilibrium okay so in general if two phases of a single substance are in equilibrium with one another then the chemical potentials of that substance in the two phases are equal okay so in the case of liquid vapor equilibrium the chemical potential of the liquid phase is equal to that of the gaseous phase, okay? So there's no particular phase that is actually preferred in these conditions, okay? So that's why both the liquid and the gaseous phases are stable during the phase transition, all right? Okay, so however, let's consider what happens when we have non-equilibrium, okay? So if there's, not, if there's no equilibrium, there's going to be a transfer of material such that dg is going to be less than zero, okay? So this is going to correspond to the spontaneous phase change, okay? So let's consider our equation again. So dG, this is going to be equal to the chemical potential of the gaseous phase minus the chemical potential of the liquid phase times dNG, okay? So if the chemical potential of the gaseous phase is greater than the chemical potential of the liquid phase, okay, so this part over here, this is going to be positive, okay? So in order for this quantity here to be negative for the process to be spontaneous, that means D and G has to be negative, okay? So in other words, there is going to be a decrease in the number of moles in the gaseous phase, okay? So that means there's going to be a transfer from the phase that has the higher chemical potential to the phase that has a lower chemical potential, okay? So this condition over here corresponds to when our vapor is condensing spontaneously, okay? So if, however, if mu g is less than mu l, okay, so this time our liquid has a higher chemical potential, we expect that there's going to be a transfer of number of moles from the liquid phase to the gaseous phase, okay? So if we consider this, dg is equal to mu g minus mu l 
times d and g. Okay, so this quantity over here, if mu l is greater than mu g, this is going to be negative. Okay, so in order for dg to be negative, this quantity here, d and g, has to be positive. Okay, so again, consistent with our analysis, there's going to be an increase in the number of moles of the substance in the gaseous phase, okay, because there was a transfer from the liquid phase, okay, so this here corresponds to spontaneous vaporization of our substance, okay, so overall we could summarize these principles in the following, okay, so if two phases of a single substance are not in equilibrium with one another, then matter will flow from the phase of higher chemical potential to lower chem chemical potential. Okay, so essentially what we're doing here is that by having matter flow from the phase of higher chemical potential to lower chemical potential, we are minimizing our Gibbs free energy. Okay, so again, th this principle here is going to be very general. We'll see this later on that we could apply this for many other cases of phase stability and phase equilibrium. Okay, so with these principles in mind, let's also get some additional definitions on chemical potential. Okay, so recall the definition for chemical potential. Okay, so we said that mu, this is equal to the partial of G with respect to N at constant temperature and pressure conditions. Okay, so let's also recall something about Gibbs free energy. Okay, so Gibbs free energy, this is an extensive property. Okay, so if it's an extensive property, it's going to be dependent on the amount of matter in the system. Okay, so G, our Gibbs free energy, is going to be directly proportional to N. Okay, so the number of moles in our system. Okay, in order to get rid of this proportionality symbol, we should introduce a proportionality constant. Okay, so that means G, this is going to be equal to some constant times N. Okay, so this some constant here has to tell us the way that G changes with N. Okay, so that essentially is a derivative. Okay, so the partial of G with respect to N at constant temperature and pressure. Okay, so just as we defined earlier, this partial derivative, this is equal to our chemical potential. Okay, so overall, G is equal to mu times N. Okay. So what this tells us is that we could look at chemical potential in another way, okay? So this is essentially just your molar Gibbs free energy. Okay, so same way that we have molar enthalpy, okay? So our chemical potential, this is equal to your molar Gibbs free energy, okay? So your Gibbs free energy per mole of your substance, okay? Okay, so we could express this as mu as equivalent to G bar, okay? So this bar over here just indicates that you're dealing with molar quantities for clarity, okay? So we could also try to get some relationships between mu and g now that we could look at chemical potential as molar Gibbs free energy. So let's recall some of the relationships that we established for systems in equilibrium, okay? So we said that dg, this is going to be equal to negative sdt plus vdp, okay? So let's try to get all the extensive properties in terms of molar quantities. So essentially, we'll be turning extensive properties into intensive properties by dividing by the number of moles in the system, okay? So if we divide, the, divide this equation by n, we'll be transforming extensive properties, namely g, s, and v, into intensive properties or molar quantities, okay? So we could write this as dg bar, okay? Molar gives is equal to negative s, okay? So this is molar entropy, dt, plus molar volume times dB, okay? So again, we said that molar Gibbs, this is equal to our chemical potential, right? So we have d mu is equal to the molar entropy times dt plus the molar volume times dP, okay? So overall, what we just did is that we related changes in chemical potential to changes in temperature and pressure, okay? So this is going to be important if we want to determine the variation of 
equilibrium processes with changes in temperature and pressure, okay? So one of those equilibrium processes that we're interested in is phase transitions, okay? So we could now apply this equation to consider a general case in which we have equilibrium between two phases, okay? So let's call these general phases alpha and beta phases, okay? So the alpha and beta phases, this could be liquid vapor, solid liquid, solid gas, or solid solid equilibria, okay? So we just want to consider a general case of phase equilibrium. Okay, so overall if we have phase equilibrium, okay, so let's just write this down, we have alpha in equilibrium with beta Beta, okay, so we established earlier that if we have equilibrium between two phases, that their chemical potentials are going to be equal to one another, okay? So in other words, mu alpha is equal to mu beta, okay? So the chemical potential of our substance in the alpha phase is equal to the chemical potential in the beta phase, okay? So there's no particular phase that is favored when we have phase equilibria, okay? So since we have these chemical potentials equal to one another, we could also say that their corresponding changes are going to be equal to one another as well, okay? So d mu alpha is equal to d mu beta, okay? So we established a relationship between the differential of chemical potential with changes in temperature and pressure, okay? So we could rewrite this expression in terms of changes in temperature and changes in pressure, okay? So we have negative S bar alpha dt plus V bar alpha times dp. This is equal to negative S bar beta dt plus V bar beta dp, all right? Okay, so we could rearrange this long expression over here. Let's put terms that have dt on one side and terms that have dp on the other. Okay, so let's rewrite this as S bar beta, okay, so the molar entropy of the beta phase minus the molar entropy in the alpha phase times dt. This is equal to the molar volume in the beta phase minus the molar volume of the alpha phase times dp. Okay, so we can now rearrange this expression again, okay, so we have two differentials over here, okay, so let's try to get a ratio of these two differentials, okay, so let's rewrite the ratio of dp over dt, okay, so this is going to be equal to the molar entropy of the beta phase minus the molar entropy of the alpha phase divided by the molar volume of the beta phase minus the molar volume of the alpha phase, okay, so note that we could just rewrite this whole term term here as the corresponding change in molar entropy of the following transition, of the alpha to beta transition, okay? So this over here, this can also be written as a corresponding change in molar volume of the alpha to beta transition, okay? So we also know something about how we could rewrite the change in molar entropy for a phase change process, okay? So if we have a phase transition process, we know that we could calculate the corresponding entropy for that process as the corresponding enthalpy of that phase transition divided by the corresponding temperature at which this process occurs reversibly, okay? So this is just the temperature of the phase transition, okay? So this could be the boiling point, the melting point, okay? So overall, we could rewrite this expression, okay? So dp over dt, this is just essentially the enthalpy change that corresponds to the phase change process divided by the transition temperature times the change in molar volume, okay? So this is a very important equation, okay? So let's just box this equation over here, and let's call this the Clapeyron equation, okay? So what's so special about this Clapeyron equation, and where can we use it, okay? So keep in mind, again, that we derive this expression based on 
phase transitions, okay? And then we arrived at this expression that gives us a derivative, okay? So this derivative, right? Derivatives correspond to slopes, right? Okay, so dp over dt, this corresponds to the slope of a p versus t diagram, right? Okay, so what's important about a p versus t diagram? That's essentially our phase diagrams, right? Okay, so our Clapeyron equation, this describes the slopes of these curves over here, okay? Our phase transition curves, okay? So we could see here from the Clapeyron equation that the slopes of these curves, they're going to be dependent on the enthalpy of the phase transition and also the change in molar volume for the phase transition, okay? So that's why for every type of phase transition, so over here we have fusion, over here we have vaporization, over here we have sublimation. That's why we have different curves for each of these processes because we have a corresponding different enthalpy for each of these processes. We have an enthalpy of fusion, we have an enthalpy of vaporization, we have an enthalpy of sublimation. Okay, so it's also going to change dependent on the change in molar volume. Okay, so we could see why we now have different conditions in which we have different phase transitions. Okay, so our phase transitions are going to be dependent on, again, the enthalpy of the phase transition and the corresponding change in molar volume, okay? So we can use these properties to determine at which pressures and at which temperatures these phase transitions are going to occur, all right? Okay, so again, just to emphasize, the Clapeyron equation describes all of these curves over here, okay? So we could... Okay, so note that the Clapeyron equation is a differential equation, okay? So in order to solve for this, we could also make some approximations, okay? So for condensed phase transition, so this includes solid to liquid phase transitions or a solid phase, solid phase transition, okay? So we could assume that one, okay, so the enthalpy of the phase change remains constant in the pressure and temperature conditions, of interest, and we could also kind of approximate that the change in molar volume that corresponds to the alpha to beta phase transition is also going to remain constant within the temperature and pressure range of interest, okay? So we could only make this assumption for condensed phase equilibria, okay? However, if we start dealing with phase changes that involve gases, okay? So it's not going to be a very good assumption that the change in molar volume is going to remain constant because gases are very sensitive to pressure and temperature changes, okay? So if we're going to make these two assumptions, we could solve our differential equation, the Clapeyron equation. So we know that dP over dt, this is equal to the enthalpy of the phase transition divided by the corresponding temperature of that phase transition and the change in molar volume for that phase transition, okay? So if we rearrange this, okay, so we could write dp is equal to delta H alpha to beta over molar volume of the phase transition times dt over t, okay? So again, based on our assumption, okay, we're going to be assuming that these, that this ratio here is going to remain constant over the corresponding pressure and temperature ranges of interest, okay? So that means we could integrate these expressions from pressure 1, pressure 2, temperature 1, temperature 2, okay? and assume that they're going to be constant within these ranges, okay? So upon integration, we get P2 minus P1 is equal to delta H of the phase transition over the change in molar volume of the phase transition times ln T2 over T1, okay? So we could use this expression in order to calculate different conditions at which a phase transition can can occur if we know one condition at which that phase transition does occur, okay? So for example, if you know the normal melting point of a substance, you can calculate the new melting temperature if we change the pressure, okay? So we could do that with our next example problem here, okay? So in this example problem, we want to calculate 
the melting point of ice if we increase the pressure to 100 atmospheres. Okay, so we know the enthalpy of fusion of ice at 0 degrees Celsius to be 6.01 kilojoules per mole. And we are also given the corresponding densities of ice and liquid water. Okay, so the densities are going to be important in calculating the corresponding change in molar volume for our process. All right. Okay, so before we start solving for anything, let's try to write down the information that we are given, okay? So P1, T1, this is going to be our reference state, okay? So what we do know here is that the delta H0 fusion of ice at 0 degrees Celsius is 6.01 kilojoules per mole, okay? So we know that at 0 degrees Celsius or 273.15 Kelvin, okay, we have melting okay so this corresponds to the standard pressure right so let's say that this is one atmosphere so we want to calculate the melting point of ice if we change the pressure okay so our pressure 2 this is going to be equal to 100 atmospheres okay so our task is now to calculate the new melting point as we change the pressure okay so we could just use the integrated form of the Clapeyron equation so that is p2 minus p1 is equal to okay so the enthalpy of fusion divided by the change in molar volume from the solid to the liquid times ln t2 over t1, okay? So in this case, we're just solving for t2, right? Okay, so we could rewrite this expression, okay? So we could expand the ln term over here, rearrange this term here, which we were going to assume to be constant within the temperature and pressure range of interest, okay? So we could rewrite this expression as ln t2 is equal to change in molar volume from solid to liquid over the enthalpy of fusion times p2 minus p1 plus ln t1. Okay, so in order to solve for t2, we'll just get the exponential of this entire expression over here. All right, okay, so before we start plugging in some values, okay, so we already have the enthalpy of fusion, we already have the pressure 2, pressure 1, temperature 1. What we are missing, however, is the change in molar volume for our process, okay? So let's solve for this first before we proceed with anything, okay? So delta V bar of S of the solid to liquid phase transition is just going to be equal to the molar volume of the liquid phase minus the molar volume of the solid phase, okay? So what we're given here, however, is density, okay? So we have to make sure that our change in molar volume is going to be in terms of, let's say, liters per mole, okay? So we're given change in density, right? Okay, so we could get the inverse of the densities. Okay, so this is going to be 1 ml over the mass of liquid. Okay, so that is going to be 1 gram. We'll subtract the inverse of the density of our solid. Okay, so that is going to be 1 ml. Okay, so this weighs 0 0.92 grams. Okay, so let's multiply this by... The molecular weight of water, okay, so 18.02 grams per mole, okay, so now at this point we have volume per mole now, okay, so let's also convert this to liters, okay, so we know that one liter, this is equal to 1000 ml, okay, so if we do the dimensional analysis, okay, so we have ml ml this cancels out okay so gram gram cancels out so ultimately we have liters per mole okay so that will give us a change in molar volume okay so overall the change in molar volume from solid to liquid this is going to be equal to negative 1.567 times 10 to the negative 3 liters per mole okay so note that the change in molar volume is going to be negative, okay? So this is very unusual, but since we're dealing with water, we know that the density of ice tends to be less than the density of the liquid form, okay? So this is one of the special properties of water that we should 
always keep in mind, okay? So overall, now that we have the change in molar volume over here, let's just plug this into our integrated Clapeyron equation, okay? So let's move on to a clean slide, okay? So overall, we could express T2 as the exponential of the long expression that we have there, okay? So change in molar volume, so that is negative 1.567 times 10 to the negative 3 liters per mole times the change in pressure, okay? So that is 100 atmospheres minus 1 atmosphere divided by the enthalpy of fusion. So let's write that in terms of joules. Okay, so 6010 joules per mole. Okay, so note here that we have joules on the bottom here, and here we have liter atmosphere per mole. Okay, so let's just convert the liter atmosphere to joules by using our conversion factor. So 8.314 joules per 0 0.08206 liter atmosphere. All right. Okay, so we have this expression now, so we need to add ln of temperature 1, so that is 273.15K. Alright, so if we solve for this, our temperature 2, this is going to be 272.44 Kelvin. Okay, so note that for water, upon increasing the pressure, we have a corresponding decrease in melting temperature, okay? So note that this was due to the fact that our change in molar volume from the solid to liquid phase, this is less than zero, okay? So note that this trend here is, is unique to substances that exhibit this behavior over here, okay? So typically, whenever we increase the pressure, we tend to increase the melting temperature, but for substances in which the solid phase is less dense than the liquid phase, okay, so we have the opposite trend, all right? Okay, so hopefully this is clear now on how we could apply the integrated Clapeyron equation in order to solve for different conditions in which we'll have a phase transition, all right? So again, mentioned in this particular case, we assume that the enthalpy of the phase change is going to be constant within the conditions of interest, and we also mentioned that the change in molar volume is going to be constant as well within the temperature and pressure ranges of interest. We cannot, however, make that assumption very easily when we're starting to deal with gases, okay? So when we're dealing with gases, we need to make additional assumptions for that, and consider the change in volume that a gas can exhibit with changing conditions, okay? So let's consider transitions involving the vapor phase. So the transitions of interest will be our sublimation process, solid to gas, and our vaporization process, which is liquid to gas, okay? So let's write down our Clapeyron equation, okay? So that is dP over dt is equal to the enthalpy of the phase transition divided by the transition temperature times the change in molar volume of the phase transition, okay? And we could write this as solid or liquid turning into the gas phase, okay? So the part here that's problematic when we're dealing with vapor phase transitions is the variability of the change in molar volume with pressure and temperature conditions, okay? So that is essentially change in molar volume is equal to the molar volume of the gas minus the molar volume of the solid or the liquid, okay? So for our assumptions, we could assume that one, we have ideal gas behavior, okay? So one, let's say that we have ideal gas behavior, so that means the molar volume of the gas can just be rewritten as RT over P, okay? So we could also assume, okay, so we usually have very, very large molar volumes of the gas versus the molar volumes of the liquid or the solid phase, okay? So we could also assume that the molar volume of the gas is much, much larger than the molar volume of the solid or the liquid, okay? So if we are considering this expression here, the change in molar volume, okay, so this term here becomes negligible, okay? So we could say that the change in molar volume, this is just approximately equal to the corresponding molar volume of our gas, okay, which is equal to RT over P.
Okay, so keep in mind again that this assumption, this just applies for transitions involving the vapor phase and we're also assuming ideal gas behavior, okay? So with this in mind, we could make a replacement for delta V with this term over here, okay? So let's make that replacement, okay? So we could write dP over dt is equal to the enthalpy of the phase transition, over the corresponding temperature. So we said that the molar volume now is going to be written as RT over P. Okay, so with some rearrangement, okay, so we now have dP over dT is equal to delta H times P over RT squared. Okay, so let's Let's bring all the pressure terms and all the temperature terms on their corresponding sides. So we have dP over P. This is equal to delta H over R times dT over T squared. Okay, so we have our modified Clapeyron equation, which we can now integrate if we assume that the enthalpy of the phase change does not change significantly with the temperature and pressure range of interest. Okay, so if we integrate this from P1 to P2, and we integrate this from T1 to T2, what we'll get here is ln P2 over P1. This is equal to negative delta H of the phase transition divided by R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. All right, so this expression over here, okay, so this is a modified Clapeyron equation. This is called your Clausius Clapeyron equation. Okay, so keep in mind again that this equation was just derived from the Clapeyron equation, okay? So it has a it has approximations that involve the gaseous phase. Okay, so this only applies for vapor phase transitions. Okay, so similar to our integrated Clapeyron equation, we could also use the Clausius Clapeyron equation in order to calculate for different conditions that correspond to vapor phase transitions. Okay, so an additional note here, by the way, guys, is that these pressures here. These correspond to the vapor pressures of the gas, okay, of the gas phase in equilibrium with our condensed phase. All right, okay, so let's see how we could apply the Clausius Clapeyron equation in our next problem, okay? So the next problem indicates the normal boiling point of a substance to be 335 Kelvin, and we're also given the enthalpy of vaporization, okay? So first we want to calculate its boiling point when the pressure is increased to five atmospheres, and we also want to calculate the vapor pressure of the substance at another temperature, all right? So, okay, so one thing to emphasize here, guys, is what happens exactly at the boiling point, okay? So recall from your general chemistry, okay, we have boiling, when the vapor pressure of our substance is equivalent to the external pressure, okay? So overall, keep in mind that whenever we have uh, liquid vapor equilibrium, okay, so we have liquid, we have our vapor here, there's always going to be a corresponding vapor pressure of our substance, okay? So this is the vapor pressure of the substance in equilibrium with the liquid phase, okay? So if the vapor pressure is increased to the extent that it becomes equal to the external pressure, so that is when we have boiling happening, okay? So overall, let's just write that down. When the vapor pressure of our, of our substance is equal to the external pressure, this is the temperature at which we have boiling, okay? So this will help us understand and differentiate what we mean by vapor pressure and boiling point and whatnot, okay? So let's solve for part A, okay? So let's write down the stuff that's given to us right now, okay? So we're given the normal boiling point of a substance, okay? Substance, okay? So that means T1, that is equal to 335, and the corresponding P1, okay? So we mean normal, okay? So that means at one atmosphere, okay? So at one atmosphere, this is the corresponding 
boiling temperature, okay? So the enthalpy of vaporization, this is given to be 92.1 kilojoules per mole, okay? So letter A is asking us what its boiling point will be when the pressure is increased to 5 atmosphere, okay? So this means that the external pressure is increased to 5 atmosphere, okay? So if we have boiling, so that means that the vapor pressure of our gas has to be equal to this external pressure, okay? So P2, this is going Going to be equal to five atmospheres okay so what we're solving for here is temperature two okay so for a let's recall what the clausius clapeyron equation is so that is ln p2 over p1 is equal to negative h vap over r times one over t2 minus one over t1 okay so we're solving for temperature two here so if you do a bit of rearrangement here temperature two this is going to be the inverse of negative r over delta h vap ln p2 over p1 plus 1 over t1 okay so we'll get the inverse of this whole expression here okay so we're given all the information that we need okay so t2 this is just going to be equal to negative 8.314 joules per mole kelvin Okay, divided by the enthalpy. Okay, so just make sure that the units are consistent. So let's just transform enthalpy into joules. Okay, so this is going to be 92.1 times 10 to the 3 joules per mole. Okay, times ln of the ratio of the pressures. Okay, so this is 5 atmospheres divided by 1 atmosphere. And then we'll be adding 1 over T1. Okay, so 1 over 335 Kelvin. Okay, so since we're adding 1 over Kelvin, we have to make sure that this entire part over here, that the units are going to be 1 over Kelvin as well. Okay, so in order to solve for T2, we'll get the inverse of this entire expression. Okay, so these cancel out. Okay, so mole, mole cancels out. Okay, joule, joule cancels out. And yes, so this whole term over here, this is equal to 1 over Kelvin. So if we solve for this, T2 is going to be equal to 352 Kelvin. Okay, so overall, if the external pressure is increased to 5 atmospheres, we have to increase the temperature to 352 Kelvin before we could see our substance starting to boil at this increased pressure. Okay, so now let's look at the second item. Okay, so this time we'll be solving for the other parameter. Okay, so B asks for what is the vapor pressure of the substance at 300 Kelvin? Okay, so this time we'll be decreasing the temperature and we're going to be solving for the vapor pressure of our substance. Okay, so again, let's write down the information that we know. Okay, so we know that at a temperature of 335 Kelvin, the corresponding vapor pressure of our substance is equal to 1 atmosphere. Okay, so we want to know what happens if we decrease the temperature to 300 Kelvin. Okay, so what is going to be the corresponding vapor pressure of our substance at this temperature? Okay, so we're just going to be using again the clausius clapeyron equation, okay, so this time we'll be solving for pressure 2, okay, so if we do some rearrangement, we could write ln p2, this is equal to negative h vap over r times 1 over t2 minus 1 over t1 plus ln p1. Okay, so if we solve for P2, we just need to get the exponential of, of this entire expression here. Okay, so solving for P2, this is going to be the exponential of, okay, so again, let's just input the enthalpy of vaporization. So that is negative 92.1 times 10 to the 3 joules per mole divided by 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times 1 over temperature 2, that is 300 Kelvin, minus 1 over 335 Kelvin, okay, plus ln pressure 1, so that is just 1 atmosphere, okay, and then we'll get the exponential. So P2, know that this is going to be the same units as the pressure that we used over here. This is going to be equal to 0 0.0211 atmospheres, okay.
So this makes sense because we decrease the temperature. So upon decreasing the temperature, we're decreasing the kinetic energy of our system. So we have fewer liquid molecules that could escape to the gas phase. So therefore, we have a lower vapor pressure at this lower temperature. Okay, so overall, this is the application of our clausius clapeyron equation. Okay, so overall, we were able to determine different conditions at which we'll have different phase transitions. Okay, so now that we've addressed the question of determining at which conditions phase equilibria will occur, we can now look at the question of phase stability, okay? So recall from our previous discussions that the more stable phase is that which has the lowest chemical potential, okay? So the conditions at which a certain phase will have the lowest chemical potential, however, is going to be dependent on temperature and pressure, okay? So we also derive an expression that tells us the changes in chemical potential based on temperature and pressure, okay? So that is just d mu is equal to negative SDT plus VDP, okay? So let's try to focus mostly on constant pressure conditions, for example, at one atmosphere, okay? So we want to determine how phase stability changes with temperature. So overall, we'll initially consider the variation of chemical potential at constant pressure, okay? So given this condition, dp becomes zero, so our expression just becomes d mu is equal to negative s dt, okay? So if we get a ratio of the differential of chemical potential and the differential of temperature, we get partial of u with respect to t, okay, so this is at constant pressure, right? This is just equal to negative s. So overall, if we have a plot of chemical potential versus temperature at constant pressure conditions, the slopes of our curves are going to be equal to negative s, okay? So we could qualitatively evaluate the different molar entropies of our different phases, okay? So overall, we know that the molar entropy of a solid is less than that of a liquid and less than that of a gas, okay? So we could just rationalize this based on the structure of our different phases, okay? So this means that since our gas phase has the highest entropy, if we plot its curve on the chemical potential versus temperature curve, it's going to be the steepest negative curve, okay? So over here, we have the curve for our gaseous phase, okay? So the next curve for the liquid phase is going to have a curve that is less steep, Okay, so here we have that of the liquid phase, and the curve for the solid phase is going to be the least steep. Okay, so we could have our curve over here for the solid phase. Okay, so note that all of these curves are going to be intersecting with one another at certain temperatures. Okay, so let's just highlight two of those temperatures. We have the temperature at which the liquid and the solid phase intersect. So that is actually our melting temperature. And we also have the curve at which our liquid and our gas phase intersect at the boiling temperature, okay? So let's discuss the significance of these curves based on different temperatures, okay? So let's start at when we have temperatures below the melting temperature. Okay, so at temperatures below the melting temperatures, we could see that the chemical potential of the solid is less than that of the liquid and less than that of the gas, okay? So we could see here that below the melting temperature, your solid phase has a lowest chemical potential, therefore it is the most stable phase. Okay, so if ever you have a solid or a liquid, its chemical potential is going to be much higher than that of the solid, so that's why they spontaneously transform into the state that has the lowest chemical potential. Okay, so this changes, however, once we increase the temperature up until the melting temperature. Okay, so once we reach the melting temperature, the chemical potential of our solid phase is equal to that of the liquid phase, okay? But they're both going to be less than that of the gaseous phase, okay? So we can see here that we have an intersecting of our chemical potential curves of the liquid phase and the solid phase, okay? So at this point, since we have equal chemical potentials, there's no particular phase that is favored over one another, okay? So therefore, we have equilibrium between these two phases, okay? So once we increase the temperature beyond the melting temperature but below the boiling temperature, we could see here that the chemical potential of the liquid is going to be less than that of the solid or the 
gas, okay? So over here, below, between these temperatures, the liquid phase is the most stable phase, okay? So if ever we have a solid or a gas at these temperatures, they're spontaneously going to transform into a liquid, okay? So on, if we increase the temperature up until the boiling temperature, we could see here that the chemical potential curves of the gas and the liquid intersect, okay? So that means their chemical potential of the liquid is equal to the chemical potential of the gas, but they're both less than that of the solid now, okay? So again, at the boiling temperature, we have another phase equilibrium, okay? So these two phases are going to coexist because neither phase is favored over the other, okay? So once we have complete transformation, however, and we start to increase the temperature, we now have our gaseous phase as the one that has the lowest chemical potential, okay? So the chemical potential of the gas is less than that of the chemical potential of the liquid or the solid, okay? So therefore, at higher temperatures, the chemical potential of the gas is the lowest and therefore it is the most stable phase, okay? So overall, we just rationalize the stability of different phases using chemical potential and related it qualitatively to the corresponding molar entropies of those phases, okay? So overall, we could see here that the that the line that corresponds to the chemical potential of our substance, the black line here, is actually a discontinuous line that corresponds to the different phases, okay? So note here that the black line corresponds to the minimum chemical potential of our substance as a function of temperature, okay? So it's discontinuous due to the different nature of the phases of our substance. Okay, so overall, hopefully you can now understand how you could use chemical potential as a criteria to evaluate which phase is most stable at which condition. Okay, so just as a reminder, these curves here were derived at constant pressure conditions, okay, so at one atmosphere. So these curves could differ based on different pressure conditions, okay? Okay, so overall, let's just summarize the different phase diagrams for our one component systems. Okay, so the phase diagram is essentially a plot of which phase has the lowest chemical potential at certain temperature and pressure conditions. Okay, so if we look at areas, we know that a certain phase has the lowest chemical potential at these certain conditions. Okay, so we have... So I have another question for you guys. So what about the intersection over here? Okay, so note that this is called the triple point, right? Okay, so triple point. Okay, so recall that the triple point is the condition at which we have all solid, all liquid, and all gaseous phases in equilibrium. Okay, so this means that all the chemical potentials of our solid, liquid, and gas must be equivalent, okay? All right, so how about for supercritical fluids, okay? So recall for supercritical fluids, the properties of liquids and gases become equal. So this means that the chemical potentials for the liquid and the gases become equal, okay? But in this case, since we have this whole area over here that corresponds to the supercritical fluid, we don't have just a single intersection between our liquid and gas phases like a transition, but rather we have a coinciding of their chemical potential curves, okay? So overall, the same principles can be applied to another substance, such as carbon dioxide. An important difference that we can note between the phase diagram of water and that for carbon dioxide is the difference in the slopes of the fusion lines, okay? So this over here, this corresponds to the fusion line of carbon dioxide. This corresponds to the fusion line of water, okay? So the main difference between the slopes for this is because of the difference in molar volume of the solid and the liquid, okay? Okay, so recall from the Clapeyron equation that the slope of these curves over here are going to be dependent on enthalpy and change in molar volume, okay? So the enthalpy of fusion, however, will always be a positive quantity. So the negatively sloping curve for water over here is due to its change in molar volume from solid to liquid, which we saw earlier was negative, okay? So water has this negatively sloping curve due to the special property of the solid phase, which is less dense than the liquid phase, okay? So this has has interesting properties on the behavior of water with changes in pressure. Okay, so actually this has a very ap uh, very practical application. So for example, we have ice skating. Okay, so when a skater wears 
ice skates, the weight is distributed on this very small area of the thin blade. So we're expecting that the ice skater is going to be exerting a very high pressure on the surface of the ice. Okay, so increasing the pressure of the ice will cause a different change in the melting temperature of your ice. So say that this is one atmosphere, okay? So over here, we have a corresponding melting temperature of our ice, okay? So what happens if we increase the pressure, okay? So say that the ice skater exerts a higher external pressure, okay? So this is the external pressure, and this is the corresponding melting temperature that, that would result, okay? We could see here that applying a higher temperature would lead to a lower melting temperature, Okay, so overall, if we push against ice with ice skates, we can cause the ice to melt at a lower temperature, therefore melting some of the ice with the blades and resulting in water lubricating your skates and allowing you to glide on the surface. Okay, so that's why it's very easy to cause these little etchings on the surface of ice. Okay, so it's probably not going to happen if you deal with other substances. Okay, so if you try that on other solids, so... Try that with metal, that's not usually going to occur. Just pressing on it will cause it to melt. That doesn't really happen. Okay, so there we have a very nice application of the phase diagram of water. Okay, so overall, now that we're familiar with phase equilibrium and phase diagrams in general for one component systems, we can start looking at mixtures or multi component systems. It can start to get a little more complicated, however, especially considering the number of independent variables we need to consider. Okay, so just to emphasize what are independent variables, let's recall again our one component system here. Okay, so this is very straightforward because we need to specify at most just the amount of substance that we have, the temperature, and the pressure. Okay, so these are the maximum independent variables that we just need to specify for our one component system. Okay, when we start looking at multiple component systems, however, between multiple phases, we have to consider, of course, the pressure and the temperature and the composition of our mixture, okay? But note, however, that if we have multiple phases, okay, the composition of each of the phases is also going to be different. So these are the different parameters that we might need to consider now for multi-component systems. We need to specify, of course, the temperature and pressure, as well as the composition in the liquid phase and the composition of the solid phase, okay? So this just becomes more and more complicated as we start dealing with more number of components and more number of phases, okay? But luckily, we do have a set of rules to help us determine the variance or the number of independent variables we have in our system, and this is called the Gibbs phase rule, okay? So the Gibbs phase rule, again, just specifies the minimum number of independent variables needed to completely describe the system of interest, okay? So some independent variables that we need to specify include temperature, pressure, and concentration. Okay, so the Gibbs phase rule gives us this expression over here. So F, this is the variance, right? So the variance includes two parameters, okay? So two, this represents the temperature and pressure parameters. And C, this represents the number of components in our system, okay? And then we have to subtract the number of phases in our system, okay? So right now, it's not very clear how this can actually be applied. But later on, once we start calculating the variance for different types of systems, we'll see how useful this the Gibbs phase rule can finally be for us, okay? So first, let's define component, okay? So component is an independently variable constituent of our mixture, okay? So note, however, that not all components are going to be independently variable because they could be related to one another through equilibrium equations or through initial conditions of those equilibrium systems, okay? So our equation for component is equal to F, which is a number of chemical forms formulas we have in our system, minus E, which is the number of chemical equilibrium equations, minus I, which is the number of initial conditions. Okay, so let's try to apply this with some example systems over here. Okay, so for our first system, we just see one chemical formula, and that is carbon dioxide. Okay, so we, know, we see no chemical equation, so we have zero and we have no initial state, so therefore zero. Okay, so our number of components, which can be calculated from F minus E minus I, this is just going to be equal to one. 
Okay, so if we just have carbon dioxide in our system, we just have a one component system. Okay, so if we start adding oxygen to the mix, however, of course we have two chemical formulas, but we still don't have any chemical equilibrium involved. Okay, so we have zero here and zero here. Okay, so we just have two components in our system. Okay, so they're pretty much non-reacting with one another. Okay, in our third system, however, we have three compounds and they're all related to one another through an equilibrium equation. Okay, so we have one over here, but we still have no initial state. So therefore, overall, the number of independently variable constituents that we have is equal to two okay so why does this make sense okay so note that if we have an equilibrium we know that they're related to one another through an equilibrium constant okay so that means the concentration of carbon dioxide times the concentration of oxygen raised to half over concentration of co2 it's related to one another by some constant okay so that means you could independently vary two of these compounds over here and with the relationship of the equilibrium constant the other compound is going to be set okay so therefore one of the components over here is no longer independently variable but rather is going to be fixed by the concentration of the other components okay so this is also related to our next system over here okay so we still have three chemical formulas we have one equilibrium equation and our I now, we have an initial condition over here, okay? We said that this system here was obtained by decomposing carbon dioxide in an empty vessel, okay? So therefore, we have one initial condition. So therefore, our number of independently variable constituents is just going to be equal to one, okay? So why does that make sense, okay? So let's try making an ice table for this here, okay? So CO2 in equilibrium with CO plus half O2, okay? So... If we make an ice table, we said that this equilibrium system was obtained by decomposing carbon dioxide in an empty vessel. Okay, so therefore we have an initial concentration of carbon dioxide and we have zero initial concentrations of carbon monoxide and oxygen. Okay, so based on what we know about equilibrium, okay, so we have a decrease in carbon dioxide and increase in carbon monoxide as well as for oxygen okay so therefore the equilibrium concentrations are going to be i minus x x and half x okay so all of these things over here they're also going to be related to one another through our equilibrium constant expression so keq this is just going to be x times half x raised to half over i minus x Okay, so note here that the thing that we could vary is just the initial amount of carbon dioxide. Okay, so these changes here, these x values here, they're going to be fixed based on the equilibrium constant. Okay, so that's why the number of independently variable constituents is now just equal to 1. Okay, so to be more specific, in this particular system, this independently variable constituent is the initial amount of carbon dioxide. Okay, so hopefully the concept of independently variable constituent, which is our component, is now clear to you guys. Okay, so now let's look at the second part of our Gibbs phase rule, which is the number of phases, okay? So phase actually has a more specific thermodynamic definition, okay? So this is, is defined as a distinct homogeneous state of matter, okay? So know that this could be a mixture of components that cannot be distinguished from one another, okay? So if we're dealing with this system over here that has carbon dioxide gas, carbon monoxide gas, and oxygen gas, so if you have these, the system of these all of these gases mixed together, you won't be able to distinguish which part of the system System is carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, or oxygen. Okay, so therefore the number of phases is just equal to one because gases, when they mix together, they form a homogeneous mixture. Okay, so for our next system, however, we now have different phases involved. Okay, so we have a gas over here, we have our water, and we have a constituent over here which is now dissolved in our water. Okay, so note that we have one phase over here, our gas, and we also have another phase which is our liquid. Okay, so our carbonic acid here is dissolved, so therefore it is now homogeneous with our water over here. Okay, so therefore we just have 
two phases in this particular system over here. Okay, our gaseous phase and the liquid phase with the carbonic acid dissolved in the water. Okay, so for the third phase, okay, so we have solid, solid, gas. Okay, so this is very clear right over here. This makes up one phase, right? Okay, so it's very tempting to say that, that calcium carbonate and calcium that calcium oxide are just so it's very tempting to say that calcium carbonate and calcium oxide are just one phase since they're both solids. But note, however, that these different solids are going to have their own properties and they can be distinguished from one another. Okay, so therefore, this counts as one phase and this counts as another phase. Okay, so the key term over here is to make sure that they're homogeneous. Okay, and, they, and that they can be distinguished from one another. Okay, so overall in our third system, we actually have three phases okay so now that we went over our two parameters our number of components and number of phases let's put it all together and calculate the variance of different systems okay so we have these bunch of examples over here okay so let's just let's calculate each one of them one by one okay so we calculated the number of components for this particular system over here okay so our number of formulas is equal to two number of equilibrium equations is just zero and initial state is zero so therefore our number of components is just equal to two Okay, number of phases, we have two gases mixing together, so therefore they're not really indistinguishable from one another, so we just have a single gaseous phase here. Okay, so if we're calculating the variance then, F is equal to 2 plus C minus P. Okay, so that means F is equal to 2, okay, so our 2 here corresponds to temperature and pressure, plus C, which is 2, minus P, which is 1. Okay, so this means that our variance this is going to be equal to 3, okay? So what does this refer to exactly? Okay, so we already specified what two of them are equal to, so that is temperature and pressure. Okay, so what about the third one? The third one is the composition of one of the other components, or the mole fraction. Okay, so note that we only need to specify three variables. Okay, so we do have, however, two components, okay, but we have one phase. Okay, so that means we could calculate the composition of another component from the composition of the other component. So for example, if we have mole fractions, okay, so if we know the mole fraction of carbon dioxide, okay, we could easily solve for the mole fraction of oxygen. Okay, so that's why the composition of carbon dioxide fixes the composition of our oxygen okay so this is made possible since they are both in a single phase okay so if you have multiple phases this is going to be different now because the composition of one component in one phase might be independent from the composition of that component in another phase okay so now let's look at our other example okay so we have this equilibrium system over here okay so let's calculate the number of components okay so we have three formulas okay so we have one equilibrium equation we have zero initial states so therefore the number of components is two okay so how about for the number of phases okay so we have a solid phase over here and we have two gases okay so these two gases they make up a single gaseous phase so therefore the number of phases we have is just two okay so how about for the overall variance of our system okay so f is going to be equal to two okay so again note this two this refers to temperature and pressure okay so number of components our number of components is two okay number of phases is two okay so this means that our number that our variance is just equal to two okay so that means the variables that are independently variable are just going to be our temperature and our pressure okay so why does this make sense okay so let's look at our equilibrium system over here okay if we have temperature and pressure, okay, so the temperature, this is going to set our equilibrium constant, right? Okay, so note the nature of this equilibrium process, okay? So we have a solid decomposing into two gases, okay? So that means the Kp for this is just the partial pressure of the ammonia times the partial pressure of the HCl, okay? Okay, so note that there are one is to one, okay? So that means that the, that the amount 
amount of ammonia and, and the amount of HCl can just be fixed by the pressure. Okay. Okay, so now let's look at our next system over here. Okay, so we have one, two, three formulas. We have one equilibrium equation and we have zero initial states. Okay, so keep in mind that an initial state refers to an initial amount of a compound that has been set previously. Okay, so overall the number of components in this system is equal to two. Okay, so the number of phases, we have our gaseous phase, we have our aqueous solution here, so therefore it is two. Okay, so how about for the variance, okay? So an important thing to note here is that this 2 over here, this refers to temperature and pressure, okay? But based on our system, we actually fixed the temperature over here, okay? So therefore, temperature is no longer independently variable, okay? So that means we need to modify our equation, okay? So that means we have F is equal to 1, which corresponds to our pressure, plus C minus P. Okay, so be very wary about this, guys, especially if our system calls for a fixed pressure or fixed temperature conditions. Okay, so our F now is going to be equal to 1, which corresponds to the pressure, plus C, okay, number of components, minus 2. Okay, so therefore the number of variables that are independently variable is just actually 1. Okay, and that corresponds to pressure. Okay, right, so if we want to look at the system over here, okay, so pretty much we could just vary the pressure because at this particular temperature we have a fixed KEQ for this process over here. Okay, so that means we just need to vary the pressure of our carbon dioxide gas, which will then cause a change in the amount of carbonic acid dissolved in our water. Okay, so hopefully now at this point, you're getting a better grasp on the concept of independent variables and how to check if it makes sense for our particular system. Okay, so let's look at our last system. Okay, so we have iodine in water in equilibrium with iodine in carbon tetrachloride. Okay, so let's look at the number of formulas. Okay, so how many compounds do we have in this system? We have one, two, three. We have iodine, water, and carbon tetrachloride. So that is three. Okay, so how about for chemical equilibrium equations, okay? So actually, even though it looks like we have this equilibrium here, this actually corresponds to a physical equilibrium, okay? So this E over here, this refers to a chemical equilibrium, okay? As in a change in the total amount of chemical constituents in the system, okay? Okay? So therefore, E, this is equal to zero, okay? And we have zero initial conditions. So therefore, our number of components in this case is three, okay? So please make that distinction, guys, okay? So E over here, this refers to chemical equilibrium equations, not the physical kind, okay? So how about for number of phases, okay? So over here, we have... We have two liquid phases, okay? So if you want to imagine this, we have two immiscible liquids, okay, so we have CCL4 here, we have water here, okay, so we have one phase over here, which is our water, and another phase over here, which is our CCL4, okay, so we have two phases, okay, so note that our system here, we have an equilibrium between water and CCL4, okay, so our iodine is distributed between these two phases, okay, so now let's look at the total variance for the system. Okay, so F, this is going to be equal to 2, which corresponds to temperature and pressure. Okay, so how about for C, what is our, what is our number of components? We have 3, number of phases, that is equal to 2. So therefore, the number, our variance for this particular system is 3. Okay, so some of the variables that we need to specify, this includes temperature, pressure, and we could also specify the composition of one of the components components okay so this makes sense okay so we just actually need to specify the concentration of just iodine water or ccl4 because we know that in our particular system we have equilibrium of iodine in both of these phases okay so that means iodine is saturated in water iodine is also saturated in ccl4 okay so the solubility of iodine is already fixed by virtue of temperature okay so we just need to specify the amounts of one of these components okay so for example if we specify the amount of water we already know the maximum amount of iodine that could dissolve in there 
And that would be also proportional to the maximum solubility of CCL4, okay? So just by fixing one of the components, we also fix the other components, okay? So overall, hopefully, hopefully the usefulness, hopefully calculating the variance of different systems is now clear to you guys. So to compound this, we could apply the Gibbs phase rule to our one component systems, which we've been talking about earlier. Okay, so let's consider the phase diagram of water. Okay, so for this, we'll be calculating the different, the different variances for each of the parts of our phase diagram. Okay, so let's get our general equation for Gibbs, the Gibbs phase rule. So it's F is equal to 2 plus C minus P. Okay, so C in this case, we just have one component, right? So that is equal to 1. So that means our F is in general equal to 3 minus P. Okay, so it's just going to depend on the number of phases present in the system. Okay, so let's consider the, the areas. Okay, so the areas correspond to these regions over here. Okay, so we know that in the areas, we only have one phase present. Okay, so only one phase is going to be stable in the areas in our phase diagram. Okay, so this means that F is going to be equal to 3 minus 1. Okay, so that means the variance is 2. Okay, so that means in order to specify an area in this region, you need to specify both the temperature and the pressure. Okay, so for example, if I'm saying that I have a solid, okay, so I need to specify the temperature and pressure to indicate at which state my solid is in, okay, because we have a whole range of pressures and temperatures at which a solid could exist, okay, so that means we have two independently variable parameters if we have one phase present in a one component system, okay, so if we expand this to the curves, how many phases exist along the curves, okay, so we have two phases existing along the curves, so what is our variance, okay, so our variance is equal to 3 minus p, okay, so since p is equal to Two, that means our variance is just equal to 1. Okay, so that means we need to specify either the temperature or the pressure. Okay, so say that I know that I have solid in equilibrium with a liquid. Okay, so if I just specify either a temperature or pressure, I would be able to define the other parameter. Okay, so for example, if I say that I have a solid and liquid at a certain temperature T, okay, so say that, so let's say that this is temperature T. Okay, so I know that I have a solid and liquid present. There's only going to be one possible pressure at which that corresponds to temperature T, and that is right over here. Okay, so just by specifying temperature T, I already know automatically what pressure that corresponds to, okay? So overall, this just emphasizes that you just have one independent variable, okay? So same thing goes if you specify pressure, okay? So say that I know that I have a solid and a liquid at pressure 2, okay? So at pressure 2, if I know that I have a solid and liquid, that only corresponds to one particular temperature, okay? And that is your temperature 2, okay? So... Overall, if you have two phases, the number of independent variables is just one, okay? So how about for intersections, okay? So for intersections are triple points, okay? So the number of phases present in a triple point is equal to three, okay? So our variance, this is equal to three minus P. So in this case, it's three minus three, so that means we have zero, okay? So overall, if I know that I have solid, liquid, and gas all at equilibrium with one another, and I know that I'm dealing with water, that means I already know at which condition this occurs because there's only one triple point of water, okay, that has all of these different phases, okay? So overall, just by specifying that I have this type of system, okay, the variance is equal to zero, okay? So automatically, I already know at which conditions this is going to occur. Okay, so overall, hopefully now the Gibbs phase rule is very clear. Okay, so you're able to apply this for one our one component systems. Okay, so we could also look at another one component system, which is that for sulfur. Okay, so sulfur has another type of solid phase. Okay, so it has the lambda and the omega solid phases. Okay, so this is uh, an example of a more complex one component phase diagram. Okay, so note here that we have three triple points, okay? So we have a triple point over here in which we have lambda, omega, and gas in equilibrium. At this triple point over here, you have omega, liquid, and gas present, 
And in this particular triple point, on the other hand, you have lambda, omega, and liquid present. Okay. Okay, so overall, we just talked about one component systems, and we also talked about the Gibbs phase rule as a prelude to our discussion on multiple component phase equilibria. Okay, so next up, for our next video, we'll be discussing condensed phase equilibria. Okay, so we'll be looking at two component and three component systems. And for our next next video, we'll then discuss liquid vapor equilibria for multiple component systems as well as colligative properties. Okay.